2018 is upon us. Resolutions are made to be broken, as some say. However, perhaps it's time to have a revolution instead and uh, let God's Spirit work in us to change our lives 180 degrees. Unless we are quite happy with who we are and where we are at, then that's another story. I hope not, because I personally feel the time has come for me to to let that happen. Um, so I don't have resolutions, I have goals. <clears throat> you may think, say, well, it's just a matter of semantics, but that's the way I like to see it. Personally, when I, I feel that when I have goals, then I'm more focused and I have a sense of direction and God then can work through that means to help me move on to the next level of the development of my relationship with him and the development of myself as a person, as a whole. So I'm quite excited about the goals that I've already started to list. There are 15 at the moment. And uh, I used to have two pages, but I said, oh, no, that's, it's not going to, that, that didn't work. Uh, but those 15, I'm pretty confident by his grace, I will accomplish before 2018 is over, and perhaps even add some more, because I have another list, which will be for 2019, God willing, if I'm still around, <laughs> and beyond. Uh, yes, I can't wait for 2018 to begin, because that's going to be one year closer to the second coming of Jesus, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's, that's really great. So um, today we're going to, um, let's see if this is, yeah. This is the topic for today, the definite solution to all problems. How about that? That's a tall order, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, obviously I don't have it, none of us has that, but we know where to find it. And that's what we're going to do. And uh, <clears throat> now, what would you uh, if an, do if an enemy destroyed the masterpiece you just finished creating with all your love? Uh, you would probably try to rebuild it if it uh, were possible, and perhaps even improve on it. And that's exactly what God is planning to do with this world. And that's, let's see how he's going to do that. He actually has a rescue plan because we're in deep trouble, aren't we? Adam and Eve lived uh, in the glory of a perfect world in the beginning, but then their sin brought ruin to this planet. In figurative language, we could say that they rolled down into a deep well of darkness where we are all currently stuck. Uh, we've all been born in this well, grown up, reproduced, aged, become diseased, died, and been buried many times without hope. But thanks be to God, who began a rescue plan as soon as the first couple sinned, because before the foundations of the earth were laid, the Father and the Son had united in a covenant to, uh, to redeem man and woman if he should be overcome by Satan. So the first part of the plan was this, found in Matthew chapter uh, 1. Uh, no, this is, wait a minute, I got a little bit too far. Yeah. Jesus came to Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized uh, uh, by him. And uh, Matthew 3, 14. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you are coming to me. So before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to um, make her a public example, uh, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, 
He, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his uh, wife. And... Um, did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name uh, Jesus. And so, <clears throat> Jesus didn't have any sins to bury, we know that. This is the, the birth, and then uh, Luke 2.40, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And suddenly, a voice came from heaven saying, right, getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Uh, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus didn't have, we know, any sins uh, to, oh, to, 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 sorry, sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. So you, Jesus was baptized by him, and John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. And, but Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him, and were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice from heaven came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, Jesus didn't have any sins to bury. We know that, but he still asked to be baptized. Uh, that is to set us who are sinners an example to have our sins washed away. And after his baptism, Jesus began his ministry of love, and that's how Peter describes it in Acts 10, verses 37 38. That word, you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now we are told that there were whole villages where there was not a, man, a moan of sickness in any house. For Jesus had passed through them and healed all their sick. His work gave evidence of his divine anointing. Love, mercy, compassion, were revealed in every act of his life. I hope we let this sink in. Love, mercy, and compassion were revealed in every act of his life. Even sometimes when we have to say to our brother and sister, what you are doing is not quite right, is it? Still, love, mercy, and compassion has to shine through. His heart went out in tender sympathy to the children of man. He took man's nature that he might reach man's wants. The poorest and humblest were not afraid to approach him. Even little children were attracted to him. They loved to climb upon his knees and gaze and at into the pensive face benignant with love. 
And so still none of this was taken into consideration. It didn't matter that 5,000 men were fed, nor that the blind received sight, nor that the lame could walk, or that the mute could sing praises to God because of the wonders that Jesus performed. Satan was his enemy, and he would do everything in his power to try and destroy him. And so Peter adds in his sermon, Acts 10, verses 39 to 43, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both uh, in uh, the land of the Jews and in the Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even uh, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who is ordained by God to be judged of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. So they murdered him. But that death was not an accident. It was part of the plan that was made since the beginning of time. Jesus, like Moses, lifted up a snake in the wilderness. The cross was lifted up on Calvary, where it could be compared to a bridge between this fallen world and the infinite heavens. So Jesus descended to the abyss where we had fallen and surrendered his life so that we could be lifted up out of the abyss through his sacrifice and we could live through him. So we can now say that our debt was paid on the cross where Christ gave his life for us. And one day, one day we will be able to return to the paradise lost by our first parents' disobedience. So Jesus gathered with his disciples to have his last supper just a few hours before he was sentenced to death. He encouraged them with a solemn declaration that can also give us hope even today. Let not your heart be troubled. John 14 verses 1 to 3. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And so this is the promise to restore the lost Eden. And Jesus won't allow his enemy to ruin his masterpiece forever, surely, will he? He will return to give a definite solution to all the problems we face today in our homes and in our lives. Christ's return will be the climax of Earth's history. Every person alive will witness the return of the King of Kings who is coming to take possession of what has already belonged to him, always belonged to him. Now you are probably interested about the timing of this awaited rescue. The disciples were uh, also curious about it, and they went to Jesus to find out, Matthew 24, verse uh, 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. And in addition to what Matthew stated, there are other signs 
that alert us in the dearness of Jesus' second coming. For example, the struggle between the rich and the poor. As we read in James chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and you will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of uh, the laborers who moved your fears, which you kept back by fraud, Cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in day of slaughter. You have lived on the earth, and you have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Yes. <laughs> for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the earth, the early and latter rain. You also be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. The agony of the people, as we read in Luke 21, verse 26, and others, 21, 26, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And of course, family problems are also assigned that Jesus is coming soon. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, beginning with verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Dangers that Look, our homes haven't escaped the prophetic warning, but they are bearable if we remember that something great is about to happen, and it will happen. The second coming of Christ is the only hope for the human family. The doctrine of the second advent is the very keynote of the sacred scriptures. The Savior's parting promise upon Oliver that he would come again lighted up the future for his disciples. Oops. Sorry, there's something not quite right with the, <laughs> the changing of the slides here. Well, let's carry on. There's a quote from Ellen White, which I'm trying to see where it is. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The Savior's parting promise upon Olivet that he would come again, lighted up the future for his disciples, filling their hearts with joy and hope that sorrow could not quench nor trials dim. And so we need preparation. And I will give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Okay, mom, 
a young boy said to his mother, my teacher said that this world is a temporary place where God allows us to live until we are ready for a new world. But mom, I don't see anybody getting ready for anything. I see you get ready to go to work and Elsa gets ready whenever she comes to visit us. But I don't see anybody getting ready to come to heaven. So if anyone wants to get there, why don't they prepare themselves? Don't you think that's a very simple, sweet, but good question? Okay, but really, how can we prepare ourselves for this? It's actually not that difficult, is it? Every unpleasant event that we are confronted with and all the bad news we receive are actually good news because they are foretelling us what is about to come. The passing of one year is one year closer to the last line of the last chapter of the last book of humankind's earthly history that will give way to God's everlasting sin-free future. There's a story about a mother who sent her young daughter and son on a ship under the protection of the crew, and the father would be waiting for them on arrival. But as they were in the middle of the sea, a great storm broke. Many passengers were scared, and the little girl, too, wept in fear. And nothing could calm her down until her young brother said to her, Don't cry, Rosita. Remember that dad is waiting for us as soon as the storm is over. So that method is the same for us today. Hold on just a little longer because when it is all over, Jesus returns to save us. We will be next to our, our heavenly father in the safety of his eternal embrace. So today, let us lift up our heads for the dawn of Christ's coming is on the horizon of God's timetable. Let's say amen to that, shall we?